Okay, this is uh, the tutorial for chemistry 20. And today we're going to talk about electronegativity. Here we have a pretty cool picture that shows a molecule. Okay, this is hydrogen chloride. And you can see, you know, you have a nucleus here, a larger nucleus for chlorine, small one for uh, hydrogen. And also you can see that there is... Um, you know, a darker, a bigger area of the electron cloud over here. And if you have more of the electron cloud, or more presence of electrons, you will have a partial negative charge. That's what's showing. And since the hydrogen is sort of missing its, its electron for the most part, it has a partial positive charge. And then if you just have hydrogen, it's uh, balanced, so you have no partial charges. Okay, and that's what electronegativity is, is really getting at, is um, the difference in charge and just charge in general, and the, the attractive and repulsive forces that go along with it. Okay, now the basic units are ionic, um, sort of when you talk about ionic versus covalent bonds. Let's talk about that for a second. Ionic compounds form repeating units. Okay, and covalent bombs form distinct molecules. So you can get more of a, a lattice or a matrix going with an ionic compound. If you think of something like table salt, you have crystals. Well, crystals are formed from repeating units. Um, now consider adding two sodium chloride compared to water, okay? So with sodium chloride, the atoms of, of chloride and, and sodium can add individually, forming a compound with millions of atoms. Whereas with water, you can't add sort of one water to the next water to the next water. They all will form molecules of water that form the basic unit. <clears throat> Now, if we consider a liquid like water, um, why do molecules stay together? Okay, because you have this area where the water is, and but why doesn't it go, you know, over here? Well, there must be attractive forces between the molecules to keep them together. Now, we should make a distinction between intramolecular forces and intermolecular forces. Intramolecular forces occur um, within the atom itself, or between atoms of the molecule, rather, uh, whereas your intermolecular forces occur between molecules. And intramolecular forces are always much stronger. Okay, so the basic ionic or covalent bonds are always much stronger than the intramolecular forces that we will be talking about. Now, we do not consider intramolecular forces in ionic bonding because there are no molecules, okay? Uh, so we're basically talking about intramolecular forces uh, when we have molecular compounds. We will see that the type of intramolecular bond determines the type of intermolecular force. Okay, so we have described ionic bonds as stealing electrons. In fact, all bonds share equally or unequally. Note how bonding electrons spend their time, so to speak. So here we have, if you have two different atoms and they have the same electronegativity, we call that a nonpolar. In this case, covalent because we have two nonmetals uh, or atoms binding together, so it's covalent. And because there's no difference in charge, that's nonpolar. Now you can also have, if you have an unequal sharing of electrons, a polar covalent bond, such as you would see in hydrogen chloride. And here you have a partial positive charge, a partial negative charge. And then when you go to ionic, then you will actually have the formation of, of a complete positive and negative charge that is... Um, not partial. So the delta symbol, this little funny looking D, that is indicating a partial charge. Now, um, bonding electrons are shared in the compounds, but if you talk about ionic compounds, 
the sharing is so unequal, it's described often as, as an exchange. Okay. Now, if we talk about electronegativity, you want to recall that it's a number that describes the relative ability of an atom when bonded to attract electrons. So if I look on the periodic table, I will see electronegativity um, numbers. Okay. Now, depending on the periodic table, um, the one that I'm looking at, the electronegativity is right underneath the atomic number. Okay. And for fluorine, for example, I can see that its, it's electronegativity is 4, which is the, the largest electronegativity on the periodic table. Okay, now it's not only the magnitude of the pure, of the electronegativity in a compound that that uh, matters; it's the difference. Okay, so if you have a highly electronegative um, atom binding with a very uh, sort of low negativity atom, you'll have a large electronegativity difference, and that will determine what kind of bonding is occurring. Okay. So let's take an example, um, nitrogen bromide or nitrogen tribromide. Uh, the difference in electronegativity, we can see, okay, let's take a look at nitrogen. Nitrogen is three. I take a look at bromine. Bromine is also three on this periodic table, but I guess on another one it could be 2.8. So the difference is 0.2 for all of the bonds. So Basically, if we have electronegativity difference that's below 0.5, whether it was zero or not, it is going to be a covalent, nonpolar covalent bond. Now, if the difference between the electronegativities is between 0.5 and 1.7, then I would describe it as a polar covalent bond. And if the electronegativity difference is 1.7 or above, I would describe that as an ionic compound. So here's an example. Let's find the electronegativity difference for HCl, CRO, Br2, um, H2O, CH4, and KCl. All right. So we have to look in the periodic table. We find for chlorine, it's 3, hydrogen, 2.1. The difference is 0.9, so that's greater than 0.5, which means that it is not a nonpolar covalent, but a polar covalent bond. Okay, so if we have chromium oxide, <clears throat> oxygen is 3.5, chromium 1.6. The difference is 1.5, that's greater than 1, or 1.9 which is greater than 1.5, which makes that an ionic bond. Now you can also see here I have a metal and a nonmetal. And generally we know that that's all ionic bonds just because it's a metal and a nonmetal. But the difference in electronegativity confirms that it is indeed that kind of bonding. Now if we have bromine or Br2, which is this bromine gas, um, of course any molecular element has the same electronegativity for all its atoms and will have an electronegativity difference of zero, making it a nonpolar covalent bond. Uh, something like water, you have 3.5 for oxygen, 2.1 for um, hydrogen, so the difference is 1.4. So it's just below the threshold uh, of being an ionic compound. Okay? Because the threshold is 1.5, it's not greater or equal to. So it's not quite ionic, but it's still a polar covalent bond. Uh, CH4, the difference is only 0.4, so it's covalent, nonpolar covalent. And I have KCl, I would expect it to be ionic because I have a um, metal with a nonmetal. And chlorine has three as electronegativity. Um, potassium is 0.8, so potassium chloride. The difference is 2.2, that's quite a bit above 1.5, so it is an ionic compound. Okay, now the electronegativity can uh, affect the physical properties. Okay, 
if you look at, say, hydrogen chloride, the partial charges will help keep the molecule together. Now, if the molecules help stay together through these forces, it is going to have a higher melting or boiling point. Okay, so the higher the delta En, or the higher the electronegativity difference, you usually will have a higher melting or boiling point. Okay, <clears throat> so it says for each one of these, pick the lower boiling point. So you just find out what the electronegativity differences are. And we find that um, between CaCl2 and CaF2, the difference of one is two and the other one's three. So the one with three has the higher melting boiling point. Okay, KCl is higher than LBr, so it has a higher melting boiling point. Um, H2O has a greater electronegativity difference than H2S, therefore it has a high, higher melting boiling point. Now, there are other factors that can influence things like boiling point and melting point, such as atomic size. Usually, the larger the, uh, the atomic size, the larger the melting or boiling point. Uh, but it's not the only important factor. Or rather, so electronegativity difference is not the only important factor. Okay? But it is usually the dominant factor in, in most molecules. Okay? And it is the most useful when comparing atoms that are similar, okay, similar size. Okay, so you could go through the same process of picking which one with the lower boiling point. Um, but we're going to talk here, these characteristics will also affect things like solubility, uh, such as why oil and water don't mix. Now, oil is a nonpolar molecule, okay, nonpolar bonding, and water is polar. Therefore, the polar molecules are going to be attracted to one another and not to the nonpolar, so they pull themselves together and basically squeeze out the oil, okay, which doesn't have any charge out of the way. It is not attracted, therefore it is excluded. All right. Well, that pretty much covers what I wanted to talk about today as far as uh, electronegativity and electronegativity differences and how that affects some of the physical characteristics of substances. Once you watch this tutorial, make sure you um, create a tutorial summary and submit it to the Dropbox. Have a good day.